Welcome everybody to our second annual Impact oh, fin, uh, New York Financial Writers Association Impact Award and a, uh, a special uh, webinar on the story behind the winning stories. Uh, I'm the president this year of the Financial Writers, so I have the honor of um, handing out this year's Impact Award, which recognizes a uh, honors a story or a body of work by business journalists whose whose work has actually spurred an impact, whether that is uh, um, a political reaction or new legislation or uh, just a new way of doing things. And today, uh, this is truly an international uh, gathering here where I am in Manhattan. Our award recipients are coming from Singapore, Thailand, Frankfurt, and London. Um, so I would like to start with uh, naming the, uh, our award recipients um, from the Financial Times, Dan McCrum, Stefania Palma, Olaf Storbeck, and John Reed. And a little bit about each of them, and I'm going to virtually, of course, award them their plaques, <laughs> these beautiful plaques. Each one will be getting one in the mail at some point when I figure out how to do that in our uh, pandemic pause here in New York where things were a little bit more difficult to get done. Uh, Dan McCrum, multi-award winning investigative journalist. Um, his work for the Financial Times has helped expose uh, accounting problems and fraud at several listed companies. This award, of course, being for um, exposing the fraud at Wirecard, one of Europe's top uh, technology payment clearing companies. Stefania, Singapore correspondent for the Financial Times, uh, where she covers uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Prior to that, she was the Asia editor at the Financial Times Group's The Banker magazine. John Reed, Southeast Asia correspondent and Bangkok bureau chief for the Financial Times, joined the uh, newspaper in the year 2000, has served as a business reporter and foreign correspondent on posts in Jerusalem, Johannesburg, and Warsaw. And Olaf Storbeck, the Frankfurt correspondent for the Financial Times, former Germany columnist with Reuters Breaking Views and the former international economics correspondent for Handelsblatt. Germany's Business Daily. Before I turn our panel discussion over, I'd like to remind anyone who is uh, participating in this that you can use your raise the hand function uh, as well as communicate through the chat function. And, uh, and with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists. Terrific. Um, well, shall I say thank you? Because uh, thank you very much for uh, the award. I think uh, I speak for all of us when we're honoured um, to receive such an award from the uh, Financial Writers Association. And, and, and I appreciate um, this is really what it was designed for, because um, in the end, the stories did have tremendous impact. But uh, as we'll go on to talk about, it did take us um, a very long time to get there. And I'm glad we can have everybody um, join in and talk about this because really it has been a team effort uh, from the whole Financial Times and really the FT's commitment to this story over a very long period is what got us there in the end. So uh, thank you very much for the award and for having us on to talk about it today. So I was thinking, uh, so we should probably start by explaining to our American audience what Wirecard is uh, because it's... Um, is one of those companies which yes. uh, pretty, pretty much um, is unknown, even in large parts of Europe, um, but certainly in America. And so it was a, it was a payment processing company, uh, but really it's best understood as sort of a tech stock phenomenon. Um, it was, uh, it, if you attempted to pay for something with your credit card, it would be the company working behind the scenes online to get the money from your credit card issuer to whoever you're buying something from. But really it spun this story that it had amazing technology and it was doing this faster and better than everyone else. And over time, this, I mean, Wirecard was in operation for about two decades. Um, it became really the next big thing in Germany. 
Germany has this tremendous manufacturing base and it has all these amazing companies. Um, and I'm sure Olaf can talk about how it was seen within Germany. Um, but I think I'm right in thinking that Germany has a lot of manufacturing companies, but it was seen as this one company that finally was going to challenge the greats of Silicon Valley and it became incredibly valuable. And uh, Marcus Braun, who was its largest shareholder and effectively its founder, uh, became this sort of revered technology visionary. He was going to bring about this sort of cashless society. Um, is that about right, uh, Olaf? Is that, I mean, would you, would you add more to uh, sort of what Wirecard is and setting the scene in terms of the German context here? Yeah, I mean, it was seen as, as basically uh, uh, in some part of the, the business press before the collapse, labeled, as, uh, labeled it as Germany's PayPal, basically a company similar uh, to, yeah, to PayPal in terms of processing payments. And um, it, it, it was a tremendous success story, in particular with regard to its stock market value. It, uh, at its peak, it, it was worth 24 billion, uh, worth more at that point than Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank, the, 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 the two largest listed banks in Germany together. And uh, ironically enough, at that point, um, it basically replaced Commerzbank in, the, in the Germany's DAX index, the, 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 the blue chip index. And um, in 2018, and at that point, everyone was basically making the point, oh, why did all the, the big con conventional traditional banks miss the boat on, on, on payments? And why did it have to be such a kind of successful, nimble startup company, which basically makes all the, all the profit and takes on all the business? Um, and as we know now, it, it turned out slightly differently. But um, at, at, for a long time, the, the, the banking and financial establishment was really envious on, uh, uh, um, about Wirecard's success in Germany. Now, maybe you could explain to all of us who uh, may not be familiar with your reporting on what exactly the fraud was. So, so the fraud started, I think, about 10 years ago, um, possibly earlier, but it started small. What they were doing was they were buying up small companies in Asia and they were doing funny things um, around those deals. There were side deals, there were little deals, and effectively there were they were paying much less than they were claiming. And they were using this to fake profits. And, um, and that's great, you can do that for a while. Um, and so it looks like your profits are growing quite quickly, but every year that gets a bit bigger or rather you get a bit of a bigger problem. So you have to fake mm -hmm. last year's profits and then you have to fake this year's profits as well. And over time it gets bigger and bigger. And um, what they seem to have done at some point around about five years ago was they hit upon this weed where instead of doing this complicated um, sort of fraud by buying all these companies, which involved lots of different difficult things, they instead invented a new part of their business. So they claimed that they were, um, they were, they were a payment processor and they claimed to be processing payments through some third parties. And and the, they weren't holding the cash. The cash was held by a trustee. And suddenly they had this structure where they could claim there was this huge amount of business going on sort of nearby, but not under their control. And um, that just got bigger and bigger and bigger until really, um, I mean, I think at the end, um, this was you know, throwing out all of the company's profits. It was representing half of their sales and it was an invention. And, um, and what happened in, June this year is it it was finally exposed when uh, the company revealed that sort of 1.9 billion euros that were supposedly being held by these third parties um, just simply didn't exist. And how did you uh, begin to stumble on this story? What were what were the initial kernels of what got the ball rolling on on your reporting? So, so there's a couple of different stages. Um, to the story. I started reporting on it in um, 2016 and um, sorry, 2015. And I read a series of blog posts then for the Financial Times blog Alphaville. And they're essentially asking questions saying, what is Wirecard? Why don't its numbers make sense? And what is it doing in Asia where it's buying all these funny little companies where um, the truth on the ground doesn't seem to match what it's telling investors. 
And that got some attention, um, but nothing much really seemed to happen. And it was really in 2018 where we had the big breakthrough. Um, we were contacted by some whistleblowers in uh, Singapore. And uh, perhaps I should bring, we should bring in Stefania really at this point to talk about um, sort of what happened in Singapore and sort of what she was doing there to, um, to or what she found out. Yes, so uh, essentially we were approached by uh, whistleblowers who uh, essentially very, very quickly became clear that they uh, were talking to us about, you know, alleged forged invoices, very dubious money flows happening via the uh, Asia Pacific headquarters for Wirecard, which sit in Singapore. There were many, many dubious contracts, uh, signs of round tripping, many suspect transactions. Um, and the, I think what really got us very, very excited was that these, these were not just tales being told by whistleblowers. There were uh, just a paper trail and documents that were very obviously backing this up. I mean, we would, we came across some of the, the, I guess, the most odd things we came across when, with regards to Singapore specifically were these contracts. And we basically could piece together uh, the forgery of these contracts, these logos being sort of copy pasted on these Word documents uh, and companies that did something very, very different from fintech, uh, like a piping company in Malaysia, for instance, sort of supplying um, or buying essentially um, software uh, linked to payments processing. So very, very odd uh, practices, business practices that, again, were uh, backed up by all the, these document trails. Um, and what also became very obvious from what we were finding in Singapore uh, was also the kind of relationship that uh, Wiregard had with these third party uh, businesses that Dan mentioned, um, three uh, uh, of which at one point accounted for almost all of the uh, company's reported profits. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, big uh, stories we did uh, following up from the first uh, pieces that we wrote uh, about Singapore touched upon the Philippines, uh, where uh, I went to uh, literally physically trying to find all these uh, supposed business partners that generated millions and millions of euros in commission income. And some of the things I found were just uh, astounding. And uh, as Dan mentioned, the reality on the ground was completely mismatched from the kind of importance that these businesses had for uh, Wirecard's uh, accounting. I mean, in, in one case, uh, I stumbled upon uh, a private home uh, that was, was supposedly a payments company and the, uh, the, the patriarch, the owner of the house had never heard of uh, wire cards, uh, and def it definitely was a private residence. Um, and uh, one of the most shocking things that happened during that trip was that uh, after sort of asking him repeatedly if he'd ever heard of this German company, they uh, produced this letter that they had randomly received and didn't know how to explain why they had received these documents. And it was just a series of bank statements uh, that Wirecard Bank, because Wirecard also uh, owns a bank in Munich, uh, had sent them. And what was very obvious from the letters was that they were meant for this supposed payments company and partner business, but the uh, address was this home address of this retired uh, seaman um, in a very small town, three hour north from Manila. Um, so it really raised very serious questions about the reality of this huge part of Wirecard's business, meaning these partner businesses. And in fact, uh, essentially when everything sort of came uh, tumbling down, uh, the Philippines actually launched, speaking of impact, uh, the Philippines launched an investigation, uh, I mean, more broadly into uh, Wirecard's operations in the Philippines, but also specifically the partner businesses that we reported on and the individuals that were linked to them. It, it, it's really mind boggling, the, just the extent of just what was going on. Um, if you could maybe explain then how specifically uh, you four were able to really weed through all of this and put it together in a comprehensive reporting. 
Yeah, so, so what we were presented and with it, by the whistle. Oh, yeah. Britain, again, it looks like the, the workmen are back. <laughs> Oh, oh. Boy, I can't hear anything. Well, okay. He's back. Well, oh, I think we're I think we're back. Yeah. So, so what what we were presented with by these whistleblowers was this story of what had been happening inside Wirecard that was completely divorced from the image they presented to the world. So it it claimed to have cutting edge technology. It was operating, you know, big businesses all around the world, particularly in Asia, where um, if you go in, if, if you go to Singapore, Wirecard's name was, you know, in every taxi, it was on the counter of every hotel or restaurant. It seemed to be ubiquitous. But then what the whistleblowers told us was that, you know, staff had just been making up contracts and um, making up business. And so we started, Stefan, Stefan was knocking on the doors and finding out that the people on these contracts, you know, weren't really doing business with Wirecard. And then you went to the Philippines and, you know, it's supposed to be a big international payments company. It turns out it's um, a fisherman's house. So all of that added up to, um, added up to this picture. But at each step, now, now, now it's fallen apart. Um, it sort of becomes easy to say, oh, yes, no, it's a fraud. It was this. But at each step, we were, we were sort of we were, we were working in the dark and sort of pulling on threads trying to do it. So I was sat in a bunker in uh, London going through the documents. And, um, and at this point, we were completely terrified of um, Wirecard's capabilities because we knew it had made extensive use of um, hackers. There was an Indian hacker gang which um, attempted to break into the email of a huge swathe of people, um, journalists at the FT, at other organizations investors, hedge funds, uh, researchers. And then we were also concerned um, at some stages about um, physical surveillance. And um, so I was working off grid in London on a um, uh, going through the documents. And then I would find something out and I'd call up Stefan and go, oh, we found this new amazing bit. And then she would go and knock on the door in um, Singapore and come back and say, you know, I spoke to the guys at the pipe fitting shop. They, they've got no idea what they're doing. They certainly have never sold an international payments company some software. And so each time we would come back and then uh, we would try and put this into a new story and um, sort of present it to the world. And, um, and what, what was surprising, I think, about a lot of that was the uh, reaction that we got in Germany. Um, because we sort of, we started pulling at these threads and publishing these stories. And initially the numbers were quite small. What is amazing about it when you step back from it is these small contracts that we were finding out were fake in Singapore. They were for small numbers in the context of this 20, 30 billion euro company, you know, they were for two or 3 million euros each. Um, and so we published a story saying that all this stuff was happening. And the big thing was the company just completely denied it. There's, an, there's, there's a serious sort of alternative version of events where if the company had just said, oh gosh, yes, no, we were looking into that and it's terrible. Yes, no, we really need to sort it out. And they admitted to it all, all of it. We might've declared victory and moved on. But they didn't. Instead, they said, um, well, they said the story was completely not true and that we were corrupt. We had leaked the story in advance to uh, hedge funds and speculators. And this was all part of a malicious attempt to, uh, to do the company down. We, uh... I muted myself because of the, the workmen. <laughs> we have a question from Tom Herman to all the panelists. Um, well, Stefania, do you know what were the motives of the whistleblowers? Were any of them actually involved in the fraudulent activity? <laughs> uh, I guess we have to be really careful about what we say about the whistleblowers. Yes. I mean, they're... Um, so so I, I think, well... Go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say that to know that they were fundamental and that they obviously was a massive risk as for any mm. whistleblower to come forward. But Dan, please. Yeah, I mean, so no, the um, so the whistleblowers um, were were acting out of uh, genuinely noble motives because um, what had happened in in Singapore 
was that um, Wirecard had basically been trying to go legit there, uh, which involved hiring a whole bunch of serious Singaporean professionals, uh, you know, to sort out licenses, to, you know, drag the business into the 21st century. And they started to discover that all this corrupt criminal stuff was going on and launched an internal investigation. And what happened was they found all this evidence, gathered it up, bought in an outside law firm, did everything exactly that um, should have been done. And then it all went to Germany and head office and nothing happened. The investigation was basically squashed. And then uh, people involved in the investigation were forced out or moved jobs. And uh, the people under investigation were promoted. And sort of that series of events led whistleblowers to contact us and say, look, there's some awful stuff going on. You really need to um, look into it. Uh, another question from myself, and, and this is coming from uh, someone who works in network television, which is a, a completely different world. It's still journalism, but um, as someone who works in TV, I have to, 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 uh, to really tip my hat to you. I mean, we, we in television do tend to think of you guys as the real journalists. I mean, you're the ones who are kind of like boots on the ground and really digging through. And then, and then after you publish, then we just kind of put together a minute and a half package on it. Um, but in terms of your, your daily workflow, I think a lot of us would be curious in terms of this story, how, how, how did you structure your work days around working on this giant story? And like, you know, were you working on other day-to-day -day stories while you were working on this? Um, well, I mean, I'll go first. So I, I was lucky enough to be dedicated just on this story, um, essentially for the last two years, um, slightly because once I don't think that was ever the intention, but once it began, it took on a life of its own. But uh, I was very lucky. Um, Stefania, as a Singapore correspondent, was having to do all sorts of things at the uh, same time, I think. Yeah, uh, <laughs> correct. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, I cover for the FT Singapore, Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and even though I mean, the Wirecard story very, very quickly, it became clear to me that we were just sort of scratching the surface when I joined Dan into uh, sort of digging deeper on the uh, Asia side of things. But uh, it's uh, absolutely, I needed to continue doing my day-to-day -day job, which is obviously covering these uh, three countries, one of which has the fourth biggest population in the world being Indonesia. Um, so it, I have to admit it wasn't easy at times because obviously you need to continue as a foreign correspondent uh, you need to be on the news, but not only that, I mean, it's, it's more also about maintaining uh, longer term projects uh, beyond uh, Wirecard. So it was challenging at times, but somehow made it work. Uh, it was absolutely worth it, obviously. I think we're all multitaskers and I had to laugh a bit when Matt, when you spoke during your day because uh, I think especially for Stefania and us, this is something that we've jumped into and, and gone back on our other stories. Um, Philippines is one of six countries that I cover and I jumped in at the, the, the moment in June when the, the 1.9 billion euros was unaccounted for and started asking questions with contacts I had in the Philippines. So again, we, we do so many things as, as foreign correspondents um, that it, it's, it's a matter of piecing together, piecing together what, what you can, when you can. I mean, yours was a fascinating bit of the story, wasn't it, um, John? I mean, do you want to talk about uh, what brought you in and what happened and the, the yeah, mysterious Yeah, I came in, I, I had the great luck. I mean, you did all the heavy lifting and, you know, suffered the Baffin investigation in, in Germany and so on. Um, I was called to help when the uh, 1.9 billion euros was unaccounted for. Uh, the auditors had this um, paperwork showing that it was in, in two banks in Manila and the bank said they knew nothing about it. So we had to get to the bottom of this. I think I recall it was on a weekend uh, to get through to people in the central bank and the justice ministry and find out what they knew. And they said they didn't know anything about it either. Um, the central bank put out a statement actually saying that the money never entered the Philippines. Um, 
Stefani and I spoke to the banks and they said that, that neither of them could hold anything near that amount of foreign currency on account. I mean, the Philippines is, is an emerging market. And um, we, we had copies of some of the paperwork and, and it, it didn't take long to look at it. I mean, it was fraudulent. They were drawn up in about, looked like 15 minutes, maybe with the help of, well, I won't speculate with the help of whom, uh, the two banks spoke about rogue employees, um, but it was, it was very easy to see it was a fraud by then. And what was interesting was the Philippine officials were very eager to dis distance themselves from it and to say that they weren't, you know, the country was not a haven for this kind of activity. So it's interesting, whereas Germany was, um, Germany Inc. was covering up for Wirecard. I have to say, I hope I'm not on, on thin ice saying that. Uh, the Philippines was very uh, eager to distance itself from it, or Philippine officials were. Yeah, I have to say, um, in terms of the regulatory response uh, in Asia versus what happened in Germany was just night and day. I mean, um, in Singapore's case, for instance, as soon as Dan and I published essentially the first uh, pieces uh, really digging into the operations uh, for Wirecard in Singapore, literally just mere days after that, the Singapore police um, just barged into Wirecard's offices, raided Wirecard's offices, they launched a criminal investigation. Uh, but also right after sort of June, when Wirecard uh, declared insolvency, they were immediately taking further steps. They uh, broadened out their criminal investigation. They were making sure that the money that Wirecard uh, essentially was holding in Singapore based on client activity here, that they weren't allowed to take it out of uh, accounts in Singaporean banks. And ultimately, just uh, a few weeks ago, they actually uh, ordered Wirecard to seize all uh, payment processing operations and payment services in Singapore, which was a huge step because as Dan mentioned, there are thousands and thousands of merchants of all sizes from sort of five-star hotels, including the one where the Trump Kim summit uh, happened uh, in 2018, down to sort of the little coffee shop. All of these merchants were using Wirecard. It really was everywhere in Singapore. And actually, if maybe some of the larger corporates might have acted preemptively to change payment processor, actually most of the merchants were just caught off guard. And what happened even two weeks after uh, the uh, central bank here ordered Wirecard to stop payment services, uh, these merchants still couldn't process card payments. So again, even a five-star hotel is, was asking and was still asking clients to pay with cash or a digital bank transfer. I mean, it was uh, quite a, a big step and it caused a lot of havoc in, in Singapore. Well, okay, we do we do have a, a question from one of, one of the participants, Dan Hertzberg. Uh, he's raised his hand. I am hoping that I do this right by clicking on him. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if he, can anybody see him or hear him? Dan, you're out there. Oh, wait, he's chatting, I'm sorry. Um, Dan, if, if you're if you can hear me, if you could just type your question, I guess I, I don't know how to actually put you on. But Cesare is asking a question. Can you talk about what you called one of the boldest pieces um, in the in, uh, jour in of journalism in the Financial Times' history? The decision to publish the actual spreadsheet with the names of fake clients and revenues, uh, including alum. What was the decision making behind that? And how did you manage to do it while protecting the whistleblower source? Okay, so I might have to set the scene a little bit um, here. Hello. So, uh... oh, 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 there's Dan. Yeah, okay, I figured yeah. out how to use this. Okay. Uh, okay, all right. Well, we'll put that, we'll put a pin on, on, on Cesare's question and go ahead, Dan. Yeah, um, you know, uh, we're sort of used to regulatory capture and all of that and, you know, mild regulation like London and things like that. But the German, the, the, the German situation that the regulators, what they did is really extraordinary. And to actively investigate the FT 
rather than dealing with this fraud. Has anyone gotten to the bottom of how that happened? I've seen some stories, some about it, but have you gotten, I mean, it's really amazing. Uh, I suppose Deutsche Bank would be the other example, but. Um, yeah, maybe well, I'll I take that one. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're right, the, um, the German, well, authorities, be it the regulatory authorities, be it the criminal prosecutors, or the accounting watchdogs, um, all got it wrong and, and didn't really, um, well, believe, uh, take the evidence we were raising and others were raising seriously for, for way too long. And th th there was only an, a, a criminal investigation launched, not when the when when it became clear that the bank accounts, which were supposed to to show that Wirecard was holding those 1.9 billion euros, um, that they were forged forgeries, but only uh, a few days later, after um, Wirecard uh, said that oh they they are now pretty sure that the money never existed, um, only at that moment um, the, the the German prosecutors actually opened a criminal investigation into the whole matter, which gave um, Jan Marsalek the the Wirecard second in command, who, who uh, the opportunity to to go um, on the run and 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 basically uh, leave. Uh, he he left Munich. It's not clear where he is. Um, and everyone was expecting that at the, on the day when Wirecard basically said, "Oh, EY won't um, audit our books because they're all documents for forgeries," um, that at that moment um, police cars would would roll up and would would would, would arrive in Ashheim and at Wirecard headquarters. But it took took three four more days until they actually um, acted. What is the reason for this? It, it's hard to say. I, to be honest, I don't have any. There isn't any evidence so far. Suggesting that they knowingly colluded with Wirecard and that, that basically um, regulatory officials or whoever else in in in, in the uh, on on the authority side was actually part of this fraud scheme. It, I think it was a mixture of, um, on the one hand, being being well proud of this of this apparent successful startup. Uh, on the other hand. Um, Wirecard was very successful in framing uh, alleged collusion between people who raised criticism um, and, and uh, with, with short sellers who speculated against the company. This goes back to 2008 when a German shareholders protection association raised um, uh, uh, allegations of, of, of fraud against Wirecard and, and, and Wirecard then said, oh, they are, collu they, they, they are having their own short positions. Which in in one in a couple of cases was actually true, and people were back then were convicted for for basically um, really? short <laughs> while um, while raising allegations against the company, and and went to jail. So and, they were they were right <laughs> just early. <laughs> well, yeah, they. And, and and then in 2016, when 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 a, when a few London-based short sellers published a, a report raising allegations against Wirecard, this, they, they, which at that point the allegations see, seemed baseless, or Wirecard was able to 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 refute them, and um, and 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 criminal prosecutors again launched an investigation against these people who raised these allegations, uh, accusing them of market manipulation. And with this kind of history of ap apparent, um, well, short attacks, it, it, it was quite easy, I think, for Wirecard to make this case. And at, at the same time, I mean, they, those people, I mean, chief executive, or se very senior executives, executive board members of of a, of a German blue ship really lying through their teeth in an in a ongoing and continuous basis is also something which I think many people didn't just didn't take didn't think was possible. So the the mere fact that the CEO the COO went to the prosecutors and went to to analysts went public saying oh we we've looked at all these allegations they are completely baseless and and, and at one point after. Um, then wrote the story where we published where he published those Excel sheets, which, which were mentioned in, in, in the previous question. After this was after this story was uh, was published about a year ago, Wirecard even said, "Oh, we've looked at this all, and we uh, it's baseless, but now we will commission KPMG with an independent special audit into the matter." Everyone thought, "Oh." 
in Germany thought, well, they wouldn't do this if, if they have something to hide. Um, so, um, and, 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 and this combined with some flaws in German laws and, and um, which, which were basically exposed in, in, uh, over these, by these events, that it was pretty difficult for, for the German financial regulator to, to launch an, a proper timely investigation into an allegation of balance sheet fraud. Um, yeah, this, this all explains it in, in a way, but it, it's pretty embarrassing for Germany as a financial center, I have to say. Thank you. So I can maybe answer- okay, if we um, could get um, back to- Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> if you were going to give a thought. Oh, you yeah, know, I was going to say, I, I can maybe answer the, pre, the previous question about sort of the boldest uh, piece of journalism or one of the boldest piece of journalism. Oh, I was going to get back to, yes, yeah. uh, Cesare's question, yes. So, so I think the context for this is, um, is what's important. So we started publishing these stories in January 2019. And we wrote a whole series of stories which seemed to show that something was going on in this big German company which wasn't right. Um, forged contracts, partners who didn't really exist, all sorts of financial shenanigans. But what had happened in Germany was um, a few different things. So the company had said we were in cahoots with short sellers and uh, we were under investigation. And so that had turned it into a battle between the company and the Financial Times, who was, who was corrupt and who was right. And the German establishment seem, seemed to be siding with Wirecard. We were under investigation. Um, the, the line which the company was pushing that, you know, these were just teething problems of a company which had grown too fast seems to have been accepted. And then in April, it got validated by one of the largest and most renowned technology investors in the world, SoftBank. Um, SoftBank has run into some troubles more recently with WeWork and um, other mishaps, but it, this predated it. And so when SoftBank showed up and said, we're essentially going to lend a billion dollars to Wirecard. It was this huge validation. And then after that, um, I'd started looking through some of the documents which um, we'd been given by the whistleblowers. And it was like this penny dropped. We'd sort of been going back and forth over all these documents and uh, the company's explanation had shifted. Um, originally it had hide it in complexity or said we didn't really understand its business. But eventually it had just come down to the documents you're relying on are fake. And we knew they were real. Um, we did a lot to establish that. So once we got to that point, we knew we were really onto something. But as I went to them with questions about, oh, sorry, and I was looking at the spreadsheets and suddenly I realized the whole thing was fake. All of the customers were fake. All of the numbers were fake. It was all a total invention. But then when we went to the company with questions about this, you know, we thought this is it, this is the story which is going to do it. This was in June. Suddenly it turned around and went, aha, you really are in cahoots with short sellers. And they had mounted a sting operation against this London speculator, a nightclub owner who's mildly notorious. Um, for, so it's a sort of a celebrity haunt where you can pay a lot of money to have a um, bottle service, that sort of thing. This nightclub holder was on tape claiming that he knew a big story on Wirecard was coming. So everything was put on hold. And the FT hired an outside law firm to come in and um, investigate me and uh, my editor, Paul Murphy, um, to make sure that we weren't corrupt. And while this was going on, Wirecard went out and raised, I think about a billion and a half euros of new debt. So at the point that we published the October story, so we had, it was, the story was bigger than just one story. It was like, this is the reputation of the FT on the line. We're being sued by this company. Uh, we've been accused of being corrupt. And lots of the stories which we had written up until that point, you know, were couched in relying on the whistleblowers have said this, or this looks bad, or it raises questions. Whereas this story said, it looks like a large part of the company's business is fake. And the only excuse it has is the documents that we're relying on aren't real. So here are the documents. Have a look at them for themselves and decide whether Wirecard's lying or the FT is making it up. And that's why I think it was so bold because um, that was really what it took. 
And that was the point that we had been pushed to. And I think without the backing of um, the then FT editor, Lionel Barber, who, because of all the dirty tricks that we had experienced over the years reporting this company, including sort of hacking, surveillance, and all the rest of it, I think without his conviction at the time and his backing, then I don't think we would have uh, published that story. Um, I have to unmute myself again. Uh, a question to all of you from me. Um, we now exist in a world, um, as financial journalists, uh, we exist in a world where uh, tech is much more intertwined now with finance. And I, I'm, I'm just uh, kind of in awe that you guys are even able to recognize what's truth and what's fiction and what's right and what's wrong and what's fake and what's not fake. Um, how do you kind of find your way through the weeds of, because all, all of these businesses have brand new business models and they're not like banks versus a factory versus this. They're, they're very different business models and there's all kind. we're all making up our rules as we go along. How do you all kind of see through the weeds, so to speak? Um, I can take this unless anyone else wants to jump in. I mean, but it's, you, you see this a lot. I mean, you see this with a lot of companies um, in this market. I mean, uh, Nicola would be an example, um, which the FT has recently reported on, the hydrogen truck maker in the US, which was worth some astronomical amount. And then it turned out um, a a video it had made of um, one of its trucks supposedly in action was a truck which had just been rolled down the hill. And I think sort of the FT's reporting helped um, expose that. And so when you're presented with these companies making these huge claims for their technology and you know for their business and how it's impacting, it comes down to you know simple questions like, is it real? If when you go and look at it, does it live up to what the company is saying? And does it make sense? You know, what there you have companies who want to fix your attention on the horizon. You know, Wirecard was putting out forecasts, like detailed financial forecasts for 2025. Like supposedly they had this incredible crystal ball and they could tell you the exact breakdown of their business in about five or six years time. But when you went and looked at the numbers that had been publishing for years, they didn't make sense. It was growing faster than everyone else. It was more profitable than everyone else, but you couldn't really explain why. And part of what we were doing, you know, there was all the individual things, but like the big question was, why was that? And we haven't got a good explanation. And we just kept asking that question because we never did get a good explanation. I think it was also, I think the, the, the way the story developed also just goes to show how we really, especially as you say, Mass, as sort of more and more companies become more and more complex and sort of especially the fintech space, not even the regulators can really keep up, honestly, uh, with uh, these kinds of companies. Um, I think it's important to always sort of step back and really go back to the basics, which was essentially what Dan and I were doing. So Dan was sort of from the documents sort of following the money and trying to see if things were mismatching or not. And then it was also just simply a matter of physically checking if these entities were actually real, if the people linked to these companies were who they said they were and what was real on the ground. And I think that's also what always surprised us when uh, basically everything uh, sort of... Um, came tumbling down this year is the fact that even from the auditor's perspective, not many questions were asked to triple check that the, you know, the money that Weigert said was sitting in these <laughs> the trustee accounts was actually there. Uh, it literally just would have uh, been a case of picking up the phone or speaking to uh, people that you could rely on at these banks or going and physically checking if these partner businesses were actually real. Um, and you need to do that, I think, now more than ever, especially as these companies and their structures become more and more complex. 
Hey, it looks like we have a question from Tom Herman to all of the panelists. Where are the top executives of Wirecard today? And have any German regulators lost their jobs as a result of this? Yeah, maybe I take that one. Um, so the the complex story with regard to the Wirecard top executives, it's, it's we have different, basically three different uh, situations. So a few of four of them are in in, in custody at the moment while they are being investigated for um, fraud, embezzlement, and and market manipulation, potentially facing up to fifteen years in jail if the if the prosecutors can can really nail down the case. Um, this is Marcus Braun, the um, the former CEO. Um, the former um, a former CFO, Bukhart Ley, who, who left the company, I think, in or who officially retired in late 2017 and then became a senior advisor. And we have two other, um, we have one person who, who run one of the kind of fake businesses in, in Dubai who's in, in, in custody um, and the chief of accounting. Um, we have a few other board members who are also being criminally investigated, but but not in custody. Uh, the, 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 the last C CFO of Wirecard and the chief product officer. And then the, um, probably the, the most flamboyant character in this whole saga, Jan Marsalek, a 40-year-old Austrian um, uh, um, person who... who didn't even finish his high school and doesn't have a driving li driver's license, but became um, the, the second in command at Wirecard and and basically, um, yeah, uh, yeah, most probably one of the key masterminds of this whole um, whole fraud. Uh, he is on the run and nobody really knows um, where where he's hiding at the moment. Some German colleagues of Süddeutsche Zeitung tried to to reconstruct Marcelik's. Uh, how Marcelek got out of Germany, and and they are pretty certain that he flew via Austria to to Belarus, and but but his 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 trace got lost uh, there afterwards. It, there was also quite an interesting diversion through uh, the Philippines, wasn't there, John? That's right. There was. It was uh, turned out to be fraudulent, but it captivated us for a couple of days. There were immigration records showing that he'd flown into into Manila and then left, I think it was two days later, um, out of Cebu to China. So we were all chasing after that. But um, it turned out there was, it was a fraud on the part of immigration officials um, and a false, a false track thrown down by somebody. We don't know who. And we should also probably mention the first kind of fatality or death or alleged death, which is um, uh, related to, to this um to this whole fraud scheme. So there was one person in a, a former Wirecard employee who was based in the Philippines. I'm not quite sure, Stefania, if you visited him as well. Um, I, maybe you tell the story. Um, yeah, I spent a, a week chasing after, like physically chasing after, <laughs> after him uh, to try and find him. Um, and we, we we spoke on the phone. Uh, Dan also in the past had, had contacts with him. So he essentially was uh, linked and was actually responsible for one of the three biggest uh, partner businesses linked to, to Wirecard. He was based in Manila. Um, and essentially a few days after um, uh, Wirecard admitted that all this money was, was missing, uh, he essentially, we, we saw that uh, his uh, wife, who was also involved with this partner business that sort of doubled, their offices doubled up as a bus tour company in Manila. Um, that, so she was uh, saying on her social media that he had passed away. Um, and so we scrambled to try and uh, confirm that this was the case. Uh, and also based on uh, some of work that we did on the ground and speaking to the authorities of his local neighborhood, uh, they confirmed that someone by his name and his date of birth and his details had passed away in that part of Manila where he has a house. Uh, and then he was also one of the people that the uh, Justice uh, Department in um, uh, the Philippines were investigating uh, this year. Uh, and they, therefore, we approached them and they in turn uh, che double checked that the person they were looking for was the person the local authorities said had passed away. Uh, and they told us that the two matched. 
Uh, but it was, I mean, it was quite shocking to us um, when this news came through because, well, because of the timing, obviously. But as of now, according to the Philippines authorities, it is, um, they confirmed that yes, he did pass away, but he was an absolutely critical character. What I'm, kind of, uh, cause we're, you know, it's different obviously in, in all different countries, but what kind of punishment would he have been facing um, in that part of the world for this? I'm not sure, John, if uh, we have. I don't know what the, you know, what the, the sentence, sentencing would be for that. Don't know the answer to that. I, I don't, I mean, I think he might have, I'm not sure actually does the Philippines extradite to uh, Germany, but it, it, his was, so this character, um, Chris Bauer, he, he was one of the, he was a friend of Jan Maslek, the sort of mastermind of the fraud. And he pops up again and again in different places, um, sort of throughout Wirecard's history, always helping them out of these financial jams. And, um, and, and he officially, he is dead. And that is what the family have said. But um, as I understand it, the Philippines does have, is somewhat notorious as a place where death certificates can be bought for a few hundred dollars. Um, so yes, there, there is a significant forgery industry there. Uh, but I mean, this Marcelet character who we've just um, touched on is, like Olaf mentioned, he he's this astounding executive come playboy spy. So he, um, I mean, we are we're still trying to find out more about it. But um, he he was doing things like he seems to have contacts in Russian intelligence, and he has business interests in Libya, where um, he was involved in some cement plants, and. A couple of years ago, he was involved in this Baroque plot to um, sort of using Austrian and German sort of um, NGOs, uh, you know, sort of um, people trying to do good and do fund development in Libya, which is this war-torn um, country um, in North Africa, that um, he was trying to use that as cover to create a militia force on the border which they were then hoping to stem the flow of migrants and uh, was basically getting involved in geopolitics. And um, so all whilst as sort of a sideline to his day job as a senior executive at a German financial institution. And um, so, so everything that we find out about Marslech and his ability to fake immigration records in different parts of the world and um, bandy around secret documents just uh, suggest that there is more to the Wirecard story still to come. So that leads me into my next question. Actually, it's a question shared by me and by Cesare, uh, who, by the way, I should have pointed out at the very top of this, is the founder of the Impact Award, our previous president. The question being, um, do you think that there will be a, uh, a book or a movie forthcoming on all of this, especially this uh, Jan Meislick character, like a catch me if you can kind of a movie? Uh, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves, but yeah, hope. I mean, maybe I think there is more than a movie's worth of uh, plot in this tale. It has some amazing twists and turns. Uh, I am going to be writing a book. Um, I think it'll be out in Germany before it's out in English. Um, but yes, yeah, so definitely will be a book and uh, hopefully a documentary, um, which the FT will be making um, in conjunction uh, as well. So, uh, so maybe you might want to line up in your agent already, just so <laughs> that you can make sure that you get the, you know, the uh, the film credit for it. Absolutely. Uh, is there is there anything else that uh, that we we may have not covered in any of our questions that uh, any of you four would like to? Um, to shine a little light on. Oh, that, that seems to be a resounding. Uh, <laughs> I, think we, I think we covered quite a bit. <laughs> to, yeah. To I mean, I mean, there's so many aspects to it that we could um, go we on could, and on go go on on and on but uh i mean because yeah. we sort of 
I mean, I lived this for about five or six years um, and it's been pretty hectic. And Olaf is still very much in the thick of it, uh, doing some tremendous reporting in Germany on it. So um, it, it's just um, thank you for having us on. And um, we really appreciate uh, the recognition of the award. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really been um, my pleasure to be able to dive a little bit deeper into this. And like I, like I said earlier, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating just to see how other journalists do their jobs, um, especially, you know, very important things. And, and the, uh, those of us in other aspects of journalism don't uh, have the frankly, the time because of our deadlines to focus on. So I just, I wanna thank you for that. Um, and uh, again, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for having us. So I guess um, I, there's no more questions. I'll uh, wrap this up. Thank you very much to everybody who participated. It's, it's been great. And I uh, thank you again for the, the we're dealing with uh, how many different time zones right now? It's uh, uh, middle of the night and parts of the uh, of the other where you're coming from. So, thank you for accommodating us.